we are going live we are recording so check hello there. welcome everybody uh, today we will start a really nice panel discussion about the topic managing our energy demands besides of uh, me as a moderator i have uh, I, I look myself uh, three, four, six guests it's a re uh, recheck for today uh, besides that, I will introduce myself for short. I will also give the, uh, the, the stage to the guests that we have in our panel. Uh, I myself, uh, I'm a, a, a lobbyist at the European Parliament. I started last year one month before the COVID-19. So as much what I tried is only digital. Uh, besides of it, I'm president of Circle of Sustainable Europe. It's an NGO in Brussels that is connecting from top down bottom up mentality on sustainable projects. We are also doing many projects for students, teachers, and youth workers by Erasmus Plus funding. And uh, besides of that, I'm also involved a lot in the space sector, trying to connect uh, current professionals with your fu future professionals. Um, <clears throat> Well, uh, about the topics, it's really important to discuss. So everybody who's listening, you are welcome to share your questions uh, so we can uh, try to answer it uh, at this uh, current hour. If not, we will try to answer it after that. And you are welcome then to share your question uh, and uh, to whom you want to uh, answer. And I will try to uh, get answer eventually. Um, well, the guest speakers that we have today are uh, Kerry and Adler. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Skypower Global. Uh, we have also Pranav Vanej, Chief Executive Officer of Pretoranas Lubricant. Uh, the third speaker that we have are, is Laura Herman, Executive Officer for Penitentiary from USA. Uh, uh, Scott, Mar uh, Scott Martin, uh, managing partner of Denham Capital Management. Uh, Ofer uh, Wexler, he's the co-founder of the NAM Technology. Uh, and we have Amir Jaer, ja Chief Executive Officer of e Evolution Water. And I would like to give the floor the first to Pranav. So Pranav, the floor is yours. You have in around four minutes uh, to introduce yourself and maybe also um, to end it up with a question for the speakers. Sure, so thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on this uh, platform with, uh, with a very esteemed panelist. Um, so the topic today, I mean, I'm Pranav, uh, I'm the CEO for Petronas Lubricants India, uh, but I'll, I'll get straight into the topic because there are only a few minutes for us to speak. A uh, very broad topic like managing our energy demands, and basically, I would like to take a take a take a position here to to you know to look at energy demands and sort of tie it up with decarbonization, which is which is what the you know the broader dialogue is about. And my take is here is is you know the the decarbonization obviously is a, is an equation of reducing the demand. And managing the supply through efficient sources. So, you know, what I see from my my position is that there's a lot of topics, there's a lot of a uh, lot of uh, uh, discussions, a lot of uh, uh, investments, a lot of movement that is happening on the supply side. You know, in the sense of how can new energies come in, batteries replacing hydrogens coming in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the the real elephant in the room sometimes is actually the energy demand. And and demand is a complex topic because it's it's directly it's directly linked to growth, so you know it's directly linked to economic growth, and uh, they at the heart of the demand it's, it's a complex economic system, which which translates into a simple demand uh, uh, demand equation, but I just wanted to share a quick anecdote here. I mean, in the sense of what happened in COVID, say in India, where I'm watching it from my seat. Uh, the power consumption in India, so energy consumption, dropped by 1%, uh, first time in 35 years. So there was a real real life playing out of how the demand has actually gone down. And a direct correlation of this was obviously that the, uh, the air quality index actually across many cities improved by almost 35 to 40% um, over a period of six to seven months. Now, this is all the good side of it. And on the flip side of this, there were about 70 million people who were pulled into the 
poverty line so essentially what whatever the country achieved over the 35 years trying to bring the people up to the economic strata we basically lost it 70 million going below poverty line and this is exactly the conundrum that is you know that that plays out in the policy and you know alex and others who are at the heart of these discussion is that okay if i reduce the demand i obviously see an impact on the uh, in on the in the economic welfare economic well being and economic uh, feasibility of of uh, humans and we as race so i think how to solve this uh, conundrum i think that is going to be the 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 key uh, in my opinion is sort of the key thing that we need to look at and you know we were just discussing before this started you know we said that there is a there is a talk that the the goals would be shifted back by another 5 to 10 years but the fundamentally if the economic growth is cannot be compromised then how do we bring about the decarbonization and how do we really when we say manage the energy demands how do we really want to uh, have a sustainable sort of a view i think that's that's going to be the critical uh, critical point and i would love to hear some views from the other panelists in terms of you know what what are those socio technological uh, behavioral slash economic sort of inputs that are required in order to optimize the demand that we have as a parting note alex i would like to see that you know fundamentally as a society we have growth as a center of center of everything so our our you know our reason for existence our success our kpi is our krx everything is linked to growth i mean we can never have a situation where we're going to all say okay let's not grow but let's reduce and so that in my take is that if we are not able to change that fundamental reason of existence of us as a civilization then how do we attack and how do we tackle the 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 management of really the demand side of it so happy to hear more thoughts and i will pass it over to the to the next panelists thank you thank you pranav the second speaker is laura herman laura thank you. sure yeah um pranav that was a wonderful uh, way to set us up because i took a similar approach and and have a similar opinion that my position on this topic of managing our energy demand the title of the session is really that we uh, energy demand management is going to be grossly insufficient and what we really need to do is look at fundamental changes to what it is we demand and i started in the energy sector indirectly working 20 years ago in emergency preparedness and disaster response which led me to Washington DC to work on policy issues related to energy because we recognized that emergency preparedness was energy preparedness how quickly can you get the lights back on how quickly can you get fuel back to the transportation system to get things moving again And so as I was thinking about this topic for our discussion today I I think that there are three fundamental things that I see as necessary for us to begin to develop a language and a set of mechanisms to decouple energy and gross domestic product this idea um that my earlier our earlier panelists has sort of touched on that this notion of constant growth uh undermines our efforts to meet net zero goals and i think first we have to be able to distinguish in our conversation um when we are what exactly we're talking about when we say energy demand i think oftentimes we use the language around electricity and around energy interchangeably but when we start to think about the pipes poles and wires that bring energy into our economies these are very separate sectors with different implications and the second thing we need to be able to do is really be able to think about how do we turn infrastructure inside out how do we get the the population our citizens and their elected officials to think about pipes poles and wires differently so that they can understand what kinds of policy implications net zero goals have 
for the different segments of the economy and the types of well-being. When we talk about the behavior change of getting people to use less, we also need to recognize that because energy demand one third of it is related to residential and commercial electricity. Two thirds of it is related to liquid fuels in industry and chemical processing and all kinds of things that make our modern world what it is today. And if we start to think about electrification of the transportation sector, uh, an anti anecdote that I'll share um, or late last year, I was invited to um, facilitate, I, I like to say referee, a meeting that was about the electrification of transportation. And when you think about how the original equipment manufacturers, the automotive industry, thinks about electric vehicles versus how utilities think about it versus how transportation advocates think about. These are three groups that are not using the same language, they don't have the same goals, and it became very clear that in addition to the economic, um, in addition to the policy challenges to get these things to where we want them to be, um, they're just fundamental changes that need to be addressed. Which leads me to the last piece, and then I will, um, I will give up the floor to the next panelist. This idea that we really need to think about this and when we talk about technological innovation, we need to think of it from a systems finance point of view and recognize that the least cost option is still going to be attractive to many, many markets that are not fully electrified yet. And so we have to think about how we reconfigure um, the energy sector to account for cost and think about it in from a systems point of view so that those external costs are factored into the cost of that, those products. And I think we'll have more opportunity to talk about this as we go on today. Thanks. Thank you, Laura. Well, uh, I will give the floor now to Scott. So Scott, uh, get the floor. Thank you. Um, so I come at this from perhaps a slightly different view. Dem has invested um, in creating platform companies around mostly renewable, some gas fire generation where um, where that's necessary in in the U.S. and Europe, but also in Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, and Australia. Uh, today, 20% of the countries in the world have on at least on average some relative level of prosperity, and that's all been linked to high carbon intensity. There's another 80% of the world that needs to get out of abject poverty. And, and so I, I view that, you know, the, the concept of ener reducing energy demand as maybe reducing the steep incline that's necessary in energy to mine to, to, to take 80% of the world out of poverty. And for the 20%, you know, where I sit in London and the US and Europe, we ought to be heavily focused on reducing energy demand. What that means, and, and, and you know, this, I haven't come up with this, the IEA comes up with it, everybody comes up with it, is the, is the way that you can try to meet both those goals is converting as much energy demand as possible to electrification in the first instance. And so everybody forecasts that that will be a tremendous amount. And I think, I personally believe that it will unfold even more quickly than people forecast. Um, so that's the first step. Um, and then the second step is while we're proliferating solar and wind, and they will be the predominant sources of, of new electricity generation for the next 30 plus years. And they're the lowest cost uh, also. Um, and we're dealing with their intermittent nature, how to grapple with that. Now, hydrogen um, is, will catch up. It's being subsidized now. But is that 10 years from now? Is that 15 years from now? Hard to, hard to see. Batteries are, um, you know, becoming lower and lower cost, but to to get 100% of your power today from solar, wind, uh, hydro, other sort of renewables, and then batteries, I think, is is a little bit out of reach. Batteries are more for ancillary services today, and so so I think the issue is how transitional is gas during this period of time, and I think one of the decisions that will be made there is actually not by necessarily the policymakers, 
but the financial world who may not be willing to back oil and gas and they mix them together uh, quite a bit. And so you see, you see this vacuum starting to, to pull out and, and that will create some perturbations, I think, uh, along the way um, as, as we try to moderate uh, in, in this world. Um, the other thing that we need in order to um, talk about electrification is there are things that are in the incubator stage, in the angel stage today that we need to have actually happen. Now, you know, one company that I'm invested in as an angel investor is taking an old technology, which is uh, from uh, coal kilns and things like that, which was you, you ran, uh, you, you, you burnt coal, you generated steam, and then you heated up bricks. And then you could take the heat from bricks to, to make steel, basically steel coking. Well, if you got rid of the coal on the front end and you did solar with electrification uh, and the right configuration, you can actually so goes the, the, the thesis that I'm investing in, you can actually replace a tremendous amount of fossil-fired steam uh, uh, and heat generation through through solar, and obviously the same could probably be done through wind. Um, and and then that addresses the point Laura was making before about so much of this being industrial energy that's required. Uh, so that's one another way of, of really tackling this, and there'll be plenty of others like that but we have to go, you know, into heavy electrification. Money has to be spent on those sort of technologies. And we're going to have to navigate this period of time until those technologies are affordable and usable and user friendly. And we have to keep an eye on the fact that 80% of the world needs energy to get out of abject poverty. Thank you. So thank you, Scott. Um, we go now to Amir. Uh, Amir, uh, take the floor. Uh, we cannot hear you. Amir, you need to unmute yourself. Um, maybe uh, the best way is uh, to click on the link and renew it. Alex, maybe you can go to the next. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Carrie, maybe. Yes, I will go to Kerry then. Uh, Amir, uh, can you renew the link uh, so you ref refresh yourself here? And thank you. Well, Kerry, uh, it's not it, it's a moment for you. So uh, take the. I just want to make sure you can hear me. Okay, are we good? Great. Well, pleasure joining all of you today. Uh, you know, it's a it's an interesting time in history that we are all in. I think we're we're trying to get back into a, a stream of things, and what we're witnessing around the world is, as some of the uh, my fellow esteemed colleagues on this panel have raised, is that uh, energy usage has come down during COVID, but you know, growth is is inevitable, and as humans, we grow. Uh, I've been in the renewable industry since 2003. Uh, in the early years, people thought I was crazy uh, because they didn't really understand the economics of renewables like wind and solar. And to the extent hydro is renewable, albeit as of late with climate change, it's not. I'm here today in our Abu Dhabi offices. I'm the CEO of Sky Power. Uh, we're a global company in 36 countries around the world building large-scale utility solar. I'm also the UN uh, pioneer of climate action. So I look at the world from a different set of lens, and that is how can we bring sustainable power that creates jobs to the people who deserve it the most? And the conclusion we've come to over the almost two decades is power is power. The challenge that we see and have seen over the, call it the last 15 years and, and arguably more so in the last few years, is climate change is not waiting for us. Uh, being here in Abu Dhabi last week was 45 degrees Celsius ambient temperature. 
uh, you know, people ask me why I'm still here as our global head offices are in Toronto. And I said, I wanted to experience climate change firsthand. Well, I've experienced it. And I'm fortunate because I have the ability to go to an air conditioned home at the end of the day in an air conditioned office here in Abu Dhabi, whereas many others around the world don't. It's very challenging to even begin to imagine how many tens of millions of people. In fact, the UNDP forecasts that there'll be 750 million people by 2050 in Africa alone that won't have access to basic electricity. So what is the greatest challenge to the energy transition? How do we meet the demand coming forward? Uh, the greatest threat used to be the transition from coal and other forms of fuel. However, that has changed. Today, the greatest threat to meeting the energy demands and to achieving the sustainable development goals is actually tokenization. It's blockchain mining. Uh, many of you may not be aware of the extent, but to put things in perspective, if all of the Bitcoin mining units in the world were considered a country, it would have surpassed and has surpassed the energy needs of Finland, Argentina, and most recently the UAE. Uh, each blockchain mining machine consumes the equivalent of two hair dryers operating 24 seven. So with the growth that we've seen in blockchain mining and very little sustainable blockchain mining over the last several years and most recently in the last year, the greatest threat we face is can we add more energy to meet the demands of blockchain mining, to meet the uh, rosy forecasts of electric vehicles, whilst at the same time achieve the sustainable development goals. And today, all indications are we cannot. So that is where we are really focused our energies and we're trying to look at sustainable mining, sustainable ways to charge vehicles and providing power to the people who deserve it the most those who don't have basic electricity, which we are advocates for and believe that it should be a basic human right. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, Amir, uh, are you now back with sound or not? Okay, uh, I see that Ofer is uh, disconnected with us, so he hopefully come back. Uh, Amir, are you with us? Okay, uh, also Amir has uh, not really good connection, so I suggest that we start with a discussion, and if the other two speakers are back, we can give them a short stage to discuss. Uh, I really, uh, I'm really happy to hear uh, the, uh, the explanation, and uh, there are uh, still people uh, listening to us. So, if there is a question, be welcome to ask, and we can uh, discuss it at this point. Um, I'm really interested about the topic of uh, growth and reducing uh, in the energy sector. So, uh, is somebody else also interested uh, to add some points what Pranav had uh, introduced? I'm happy to, to jump in because I think we've seen an interesting trend um, in some of the work that uh, Potentiary has been doing in the last few years because with the increase, and I'm, I'd be interested to get Scott's perspective on this, so I'll, uh, I'll raise that because what we see happening, you know, in the United States in particular with the increased use of wind and solar installations and um, you know, there is an expectation that we're going to have to go from a thousand gigawatts to four thousand gigawatts of electricity um, to meet the growing demand and to electrify the industries that are slated for that. Um, so with that growth, they are anticipating a land use of 13 times what is currently allocated to wind and solar installations. And um, we've done some uh, public opinion work in both the Midwest and in California. And increasingly, they're seeing public resistance to new wind and solar projects. And it's interesting to kind of see the demand at the local level is really recognizing that much of that 
in much of the energy is produced locally and then transmit the transmissions installed to move it elsewhere. And I think one of the questions that I have for the group here is how do we move to um, an electricity sector that it's dominated by renewables when it requires so much overcapacity that won't necessarily benefit um, the locations where it needs to be installed. Because as a city, as a city dweller, dweller myself, I know that it's not possible to get enough solar panels with the technology that's available today to power my 150 unit building um, because we're too densely packed together in the city. So I think that that's one of the things that we've seen in some of the public opinion research is growing opposition to projects and developers who've had to abandon projects because of public opposition to wind and solar installations. Well, I'm, I'm glad to take it, uh, Lauren, thanks. Um, I think, again, a couple things in terms of slicing this up. We need to differentiate um, emerging markets and developed markets. Um, emerging markets getting any capacity um, is, is a good step. As a, They're not worried about overcapacity for the most part. And I'm not sure that having to overbuild for wind and solar is, is always the answer versus the intermediate solutions that long term we'll be getting to. But I think the other thing is, in a, you know, I start with a sort of a position of a, my early days in energy. We're actually doing waste energy or energy from waste products in, in the United States. And um, there was a community awareness that you needed to have in order to get those done. And I think a lot of developers, frankly, don't bring that. Um, so, for example, you know, they take a tick box approach to IFC performance standards when they're developing these projects. And they're not taking all the necessary steps to bring communities on board. I'm very proud of the fact that, you know, a lot of what we do, for example, I'll take one country, Brazil, we're doing exactly what you're talking about. We're building massive wind projects far away from the load centers. They end up being the largest piece of infrastructure um, in those communities. And if we're not welcome there, but not, not just by virtue of job creation and stuff, but as a, but as a community member, then we shouldn't be there. And that's the approach that you have to take. And so we're very meaningfully involved in local programs. We're, we're paying keen attention to the things that they need and we're, we're donating a lot there. And I'll give you a, this is, you know, it's maybe an, an anecdote that I think is telling. One of our uh, wind sites in North Brazil uh, is next to an indigenous tribe that believe that God speaks through the wind. And we're building a wind project. We had the chief at our ribbon cutting ceremony. And we did that because we engaged them. We actually moved turbines. We did other things in a way. And so I think, I think there's a sensitivity that, you, that needs to be had. Um, you'll never overcome every potential objection, but I think you can bring around a great degree of community support um, if it's done the right way. Just wanted to get another question, and perhaps it will be very interesting to get Scott or Kerry, you know, your views. Uh, you, you're in the VC space, and you guys are looking at where is the interest of the finance guys into this space. I mean, are there any serious, um, would, would say, innovations or thought thoughts, or is there any thought process on how do you reduce a consumption? So particularly, like you mentioned, say, you know, the Western countries which have achieved a, a particular level, level of GDP and a particular level of societal, uh, I would say, progress. Uh, how do you then make them not progress further? I mean, if you progress to a level where somebody wants to go to space, you can't say that, hey, you can't go because that's going to knock off my energy target. So, I mean, uh, uh, what are the thoughts in the perhaps in the in innovation space or policy space or, uh, you know, you, you guys sit, sit at the cross-section of all these guys. And are, are there any currents there? Are there any thoughts that would be great to hear? Well, I'll just say quickly, from the, from the investment perspective, you don't see it in reduction in demand. You see it in, in increase in efficiency. That's where the dollars are going. So anything from a transmission line, being that much more efficient and far less line loss to, uh, you know, distribution, clearly empowering customers to uh, reduce their own demand 
uh, gets gets some some dollars as well, and that's under energy efficiency, but not a fundamental reworking of the economic package. You don't see you don't see uh, dollars going to that today. Well, uh, I see that uh, Offer is also disconnected with us, so hopefully he will be coming back. So, uh, yeah, no, besides, just, uh, sorry, Kerry was saying something. I think. Yes. Yeah, I was going to. I wanted to respond to no. what Prabhdeep had said, and Scott. I think a, a couple things. First of all, Scott, I I wholeheartedly agree with you, and you know, over you know, going back about four or five years, you know, work very closely with Ban Ki Moon and the UNECE in an effort to advance uh, what, what is called the people's first public-private partnerships, because going into communities and introducing... Hello, did you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes uh, Ofer. Uh, if you're ready, we can give you the floor. So that was Hello, thinking. can you hear me? Okay, thank you very much. I'd like, uh, very happy to speak in the forum. Uh, I'd like to share my concern and my idea. In 2019, global energy consumption amounted to 14 billion, uh, or billion ton oil equivalent. It meant about 160,000 of terawatt hour. Consequences of the energy using is natural contamination. I'd like to pay your attention to facts in 10, 20, 20 Lockdown led to less contamination, clear skies over Beijing, clear water in Paolo, and veto return of dolphin to Venice. All this happens when humanity ceases to pollute a natural, even for short-term period. Of course, we should decrease energy using. However, we are missing an important point. About 6 million people, including 3 million children, are dying annually because of hunger and food insecurity. The main reason for food insecurity is short for of reliable supply cold chain. Existing cold chains cannot handle the goal to supply food to starving people. For example, 55% of fruit and vegetable, 35% of fish seafood, 20% dairy, 20% of meat product of Nigeria just wasted due to missing cold chain infrastructure. To fight the hunger, we should perform a huge improvement of refrigeration structure in starving country. It means significantly growth of energy consumption. It would lead us to dilemma, what most important for us, fight with climate change or fight with global hunger? We need to avoid the dilemma. To handle the both problem, we need implementation of size solution for energy efficiency, decrease of energy consumption in existing uh, commercial process, cost optimization of renewable energy resource, and implementation of circular economic. It requires a huge investment in developing and, and implementation of uh, clean tech technology, including achieving clean energy source in poor country. As well, the greenwashing problem not solved it. I'm talking about situation when managers avoid a real clean tech technology implementation and the price it in by convincing features ESG report. Personal responsibility of manager of public and business process uh, for uh, ESG report issue will significantly issue uh, if it significantly contribute to real clean technology implementation. And what about my company? We developed a cooling technology. We invest in multi cascade technology, uh, and we came to save about between 15 and 25 percent of fuel energy spent for cooling and refrigeration. We to help to decrease energy consumption in supermarket, food warehouses, food plant, as well as uh, the fuel and refrigeration truck and fishing vessel. Entirely implementation of our technology will make possible about 12, 15 uh, percent reduction of GHG emission causing bulk oil implementation. I speak about 500 million tons of CO2 is the equivalent of 8.8% of global commitment with accordance to Paris Protocol. Regarding to heating technology, I know most advanced heating devices is heat pump. Problem of existing heat pump is low efficiency in negative Celsius temperature. We developed a new kind of heat pump working in cold climate, 
like Northern Europe, Scandinavia, Baltic country, Canada, North US and Russia. We believe our technology will uh, help to decrease using of fossil source of heating in the regions by 75-80%. Thank you. I will be happy to cooperate with you. Thank you, Ofer. Uh, it was good that you have uh, managed the connection. Something happening happened. Uh, well, besides that you had at the time, uh, Kerry had something to share. So, uh, Kerry, do you still remember what you wanted to share to the group? Yes. I, I, in fact, Ofer's uh, comments actually are, are quite creative to the conversation because I think, you know, I, I was saying the, you know, this, Public-private partnerships has been proven to be a model that the UNEC and over 100 countries have now endorsed as a way to accelerate the development of critical projects that involve the community with a form of profit sharing, job creation, and economic growth. That being said, uh, as human beings, we're creatures of habits, and asking humans to who have lived their lives, you know, managing the, the various electric needs that they have, asking them to conserve energy is probably a futile effort uh, on the part of, of humans. I think the younger generations, my kids, they're more uh, sensitive to the impacts of, of climate change. They're more uh, knowledgeable about what the impacts are. They're experiencing it. They're hearing about it. They are more likely to be more efficient in their actual carbon footprint. That being said, I think that the, the ability of technology, clean tech, to advance in the form of anything from washers and dryers to electric vehicles and, and AI to really try to find these to reduce the amount of energy consumed is the hope that we have. Uh, but like I said, I think we the world really needs to grab a hold of the impacts of tokenization, blockchain mining, because that's the party spoiler right now. And uh, given the, the growth that we're seeing there, it's forecasted by the end of 2030, the largest consumer of power in the world based on current growth rates as a country, if you were to consider that as a country. But it's great to hear that there's clean tech and uh, this heat pump. I, I am familiar with it. I think that those are the things that are going to make the difference. But it, how can we as a group, how can uh, the people who are our concerned citizens and, and people on this planet who really see the impacts of climate change come together with a very unified plan and act as opposed to just speak. And that's really what we're advocating for. The time for speaking is done. We really have to take concrete actions. We can't stop growth of humanity. We have to find ways that we can grow and come together with sustainability. And that's what I'd love to discuss. Can I, I jump in on yes. this? Because I, Kerry raises a great example um, with the um, cryptocurrencies, because I, I think it raises this question of how do we innovate? What do we innovate? Um, energy, produ energy producers, traditional incumbents in the energy sector, think that there needs to be uh, innovation with technology to produce more energy. Whereas I think in the cryptocurrency, we're going to see something similar to what we saw with data centers. Um, Seattle Power and Light a few years ago anticipated that data centers, which are still energy intensive, but they are not the hogs that they were seven or eight years ago when Seattle uh, Power and Light tried to implement a program to basically uh, do some long term power purchase agreements uh, with their local data center, but the software developers were able to solve for efficiency at the data center. And so all the additional capacity that the local utility had started to plan and bring online became redundant because the data center solved the problem itself. Blockchain currencies, you know, Ethereum takes 10 times less power than uh, blockchain. So you've got opportunities there, or Bitcoin rather. So there are opportunities for the software developers themselves to make things more efficient. So the question comes in, especially as we set policy, where do we push for that change to manage energy demand? Are we going to demand it from the producers or the consumers side of things to actually make things more efficient or reduce what is required? 
Thank you, Laura. It's indeed a really a good question because it's the direction we want to go together or even individual. Um, we have still five minutes left. So besides of our closing uh, message, it's also a moment that we still can uh, answer some of the questions that we have now. Uh, so, um, Scott, do you have maybe an uh, answer or an idea that we can uh, discuss in the last several minutes? Or I see that an Amir, join, uh, Amir joined us also. Amir, do you still have a moment to introduce yourself short, besides of a closing moment, or no? No, okay. Uh, uh, it's a problem. Uh, I will give feedback to the run the world. Uh, it happens sometimes. But uh, Scott, uh, do you have something uh, as an answer? No. Well, I, I, I think that uh, Karen and Lord raised, uh, well, everyone have very, very good points. And I've seen the same data on the, the blockchain uh, thing. And I, I think there are some, some cases where regulation just has to happen, right? And if you're, if you're pouring that much more energy intensiveness uh, into the world as they are, then there ought to be some sort of requirement imposed that that be done 100% green fashion. And they have to bear the expense of that because today to go 100% green is going to be more expensive. I'm not sure that's a solution for everything, um, but the way that world is going right now um, and the fact that they cannot curry the sort of political favor that others have to, to escape uh, under the uh, under the eye of regulation means that that may be more likely as people pay attention to it and, and come after come after them. But that's a great point. Oh, thank you, Scott. Look, you know, we are we are working on right now building one of the largest uh, mining facilities in the world and in the GCC, and it is going to be 100% sustainable. It's going to operate on solar energy and storage, and we're hoping that this is going to set an example for others to follow. Uh, absence paying some reward for to blockchain miners for uh, mining a block sustainably, we see a real challenge ahead of for the world and to meet its climate change goals. And the urgency is, is now and here with, with the growth we've seen. Okay, just a quick one. I mean, how, do, do you track like the end-to-end -end impact of these technologies? I mean, uh, the one angle of it, there's always like, hey, this sounds green. It is, it, is, it is green at one end of the equation, but perhaps not in the entirety of it. So, are there other ways and means of how this has been looked into, like creates a I mean, today, holistic impact or not? Yeah, today, I mean, you're spot on. Today, to build wind turbines requires metallurgical coal. Precisely. Yeah. That's where the world is today. That's where hydrogen, you know, is the next best guess. Or, but again, the technology not invested in solar could do a lot there too solar with electric wires and running through bricks and provide heat that way. It's going to have to happen. Um, but today it's still having a wind turbine is still better than your solar, better than your other options on a cradle to grave basis. Mm. But they need to be better. Yeah, I think I, I'm very cautious with uh, hydrogen being held up as a sort of panacea because it still needs, it still needs to be created. Or it still needs to be produced. And it seems like a gift to the natural gas industry, unless we give credit to nuclear technologies, fission or fusion, to produce that hydrogen, because then we're actually making it in a carbon-free way. But well, I mean, there are the, the realities of the energy density of the um, energy sources we choose uh, are going to have consequences uh, as the utilities commit to 50 to 100 years worth of infrastructure. Laura, I'm seeing, I'm seeing investment opportunities for excess energy in West, West Texas to create green hydrogen. Mm -hmm. and, and with the price of solar today, the price of solar today in some countries like here in the GCC, your levelized cost of generation, you know, a little over, you know, one, one and a half cents, uh, you know, and, and falling when hydrogen is ready to be used, used as an efficient form of generation, it, 
I mean, you need power to, you know, move the, get the electrolytes moving, create the hydrogens, and solar is going to be able to address that in the, in the next couple of years. So we see hydrogen has a, a very green future, but solar has to play a role in it. I don't think you'll get wind as low as solar, but you definitely will see solar as an affordable means to, to help generate the hydrogen for green hydrogen. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Kerry. I'm talking about excess wind generation, but yeah, I agree. And when, when utilities, you know, when, when the when power is running a capacity and utilities have excess power, I mean, in Canada, where, where I'm from, there are years where we've had to, had to pay the United States to take excess electricity late in the hours because they just can't shut down all the fossil generation that's there. So that's free electricity. If you generate hydrogen at night, store it, and then use it during the day, you've got, you're not allowing anything to escape from the, what I call,